morning. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Turn to the neighbour next to you and welcome them and say it is a good morning to be here together in worship. We have come together today for a meeting. Yes, we're going to sing songs, we're going to say prayers, we're going to hear from the Word of God. But the greatest thing to happen here this morning is for us to have a meeting. Together we will meet with the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Today we start a new series where we are going to be looking at some moments where Jesus interacted with people in the Bible to help us see how God interacts with us today. Over these next weeks leading up to Easter, we will be meeting Jesus. Our first song this morning talks about the first time we came to meet Jesus. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross my Saviour made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. The experience of Jesus washing away our sins, of meeting Jesus at the cross and being made whole, of the Spirit coming and bringing peace and joy, this isn't just a one and only one-time experience with Jesus. I wonder if you've come this morning longing for, expecting to meet with Jesus today. Well, let's stand together and be, re be reminded of what happens when we meet Jesus. Let's stand together and sing. back that it's been a rocky three years. It's only about two weeks time that I remember sitting here with our leadership team thinking about how are we going to handle this thing called COVID. We made all these plans, by the next day they were thrown out the window. <laughs> then a year ago, the flood. God doesn't promise us an easy road. But he does promise us that he will be with us. He does promise that in Jesus he will lead us towards the good future he has planned for us. I've, I come this morning feeling like we've got a lot to be grateful for. We're going to lift our eyes toward Jesus and be reminded of who he is and what he does. And then we're going to lift our prayers in gratitude and praise. To start us lifting our eyes, Libby's going to come and read to us from the word. 
Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Jesus, being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that every name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I invite you to stand and add your tongue, add your voice to those who are declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of our Father. I invite you to stand and we're going to sing together a song that revels in who Jesus is and what he's done in us. our Saviour, we kneel before the one who loves us more than we can imagine. He knows our hurts, he knows our struggles, he knows our concerns. Thou who knowest all my weakness, thou who knowest all my cares, while I plead each precious promise, hear, O oh, hear, and answer prayer. I'm going to invite you to bring your concerns and prayers before God. As the, the band plays, and we, we're going, the words will be on the screen, you can sing. Or otherwise you can just pray quietly 
and bring before your concerns as we pray to the one who knows all our weakness, who knows all our cares, the one who hears and answers prayer. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first, because they assumed he was among the other travellers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? They didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and all the people. So today we start a new series on meetups with Jesus. And Leith gave me a very interesting story, the one that you just heard, which I get to explore. Um, at first I have a story of my own and I begin with the question, have you ever had your child go missing? And I wonder how you handled that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Al Callum, he's not here today, so I can, you know, just take all the liberties I, that, that's available. Callum was two and a half when we took up our first appointment in Maji, in a country town. And he was very short back then, but he already had a very big personality. And one day, when he was three, we went shopping. Cu country Target was my best and only option. And being an indecisive shopper, this lack of choice was probably helpful, especially since Callum was a very confident preschooler without much, without much patience. Now on this particular shopping trip, Callum disappeared completely. It was a tiny store, yet he was just gone. I checked his usual place, the clothing racks, nothing. I searched the entire store three times and had the staff on the lookout. By the time I heard giggles coming from the linen corner, I'd already checked outside and down the street more than once. Following the sound, I pushed aside some stock to find my very cheeky, um, my very cheeky boy lying on a shelf underneath the pillows, giggling, <laughs> grinning. Here was my rebel without a cause. 
I was a mixture of relief, amusement and sheer frustration. I definitely hadn't planned on spending my morning, my afternoon, sorry, playing hide and seek. Callum, however, looked proud as punch. All that time, he kept quiet. And I learnt something that day. Tiny Callum did have patience. It just had to be on his terms. Luke's passage today, it's unique since it depicts Jesus as a child. And we know that the early years is crucial in informing an identity. But God has hardly provided us with any details. And I have so many questions. What was young Jesus like? Was he a cheeky toddler like Callum? I'm sure he must have had a lot of energy being the creator of life. How much of his true identity did he know and understand? In the infancy gospel of Thomas, which is an apocryphal document, there's a story about Jesus making clay birds out of clay while he's playing and then breathing life into them so that they can fly away. And I wonder, did he ever do anything like that? What was it like for Mary and Joseph? Did they wrap kid kid Jesus in cotton wool? Was Joseph overly protective? I wouldn't blame him if he was. Who here would like to answer to God if, if you lost his only son? But then on the other hand, surely if anyone had God's protection in this world, it would be his son. So maybe Mary and Joseph were relaxed in their parenting. What was his adolescence like? Did Jesus eat his parents out of home? Did he have a girlfriend? Was he sporty? Was he popular? Our doctrines state that Jesus is truly and properly God and truly and properly man, which means that he experienced everything that we do. So he probably did have pimples, and I'm not even being sacrilegious. There are so many things we don't and might never know. All we have is this tiny glimpse of our Lord as a boy. So I figure this story in Luke is quite precious. It begins with a normal and probably favourite activity for a young Jew, the pilgrimage to Passover, for Passover, sorry. At Passover, Jewish families from all over Israel would travel to Jerusalem for the week-long festival which celebrate God's saving grace at the Exodus when the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. And I got to gain like the tiniest view of what this pilgrimage might have looked like in my, my visit to Jerusalem last year. We were there for Jewish New Year. And on the Friday evening before dusk, we saw a great procession of Jewish people heading toward Old Jerusalem, and I assume the synagogue. Everyone was dressed according to their custom. Some men and boys wear kipp- kippahs, which were round crocheted hats of different of different colours. Others wore black fedora style hats and others wore these giant cylindrical furry hats, like almost like beef eaters. Um, the women and girls wore head scarves and modest pretty dresses. And they all travelled in groups that were like them. So young girls with other young girls, men with furry hats with others with furry hats. <laughs> there was plenty of chatter, catching up on the goss. It was actually a really lovely sight. I wanted to take a photo, but I figured that would be a bit rude. <laughs> so the previous passages in Luke show that Jesus' parents were careful to fulfill their religious laws. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day when Joseph named him, as God instructed. Mary and Joseph went to the temple after Mary completed her days of purification when Jesus was 40 days old, as required, and they completed the purification by sacrificing two turtle doves and dedicated Jesus back to God. Nothing was left out. All this shows how Jesus was living into his calling as a perfect offering to God and that Jesus' good parents were doing the right thing every step of the way. Even still, there was a day when Jesus didn't meet his parents' expectations. At Passover, only men were required to make the pilgrimage, but we read that Mary went too. This family went above and beyond in their service to God. We know that they spent the week in Jerusalem, completed the festivities, and then headed for home. And they got one day into their journey when they discovered Jesus wasn't with them. They lost their child, and I'm not the only one. (laughs) 
Now, you might think they were highly negligent to go a whole day without noticing their boy missing. And I know there are parents who've never lost their child. Kudos to you. But like I witnessed in Jerusalem, I'm told that the Jewish men often travelled separately from the women. And at 12, Jesus was only a year off being considered a man. So there were several ways that he could have travelled. With the man, with his mother, with some friends. My expectation is that Jesus was a sensible, trusted boy, and therefore each parent assumed that the other had him. At day's end, when the families regrouped, it must have been a terrible shock to realise that Jesus was missing. I can just imagine them frantically questioning everyone, retracing their steps, calling, searching. And I wonder if anyone travelled back with them to help with the search. Back then, they couldn't even call the police. Luke tells of three terrible days of anguish before finding Jesus. Mary was probably picturing her son lost, alone and afraid, or worse. And it must have been bittersweet finding him perfectly well and happy, oblivious to all the drama that had transpired for his sake. Mary's response is typical of any mother who's lost and found a child who's wandered off. She reproaches Jesus. Son, why have you mistreated us like this? Dad and I were worried sick, searching everywhere for you. And now, Jesus' response is interesting. I don't imagine a triumphant grin like that of my mischievous preschooler. Jesus was quite a bit older at 12. I actually expect he was sorry to have caused his parents such grief. But at the same time, I interpret surprise and confusion, perhaps even a touch of disappointment in his words. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? These are not the words of a rebel without a cause. Jesus was drawn to this place where he could connect with God. He used a new term, my father. Already at 12, he understood the special relationship he had, one which he invites us to share, remember, how he taught the disciples to pray our father. And he, surprised, and he was surprised that his parents hadn't received that same message, that he would be there. I don't know how he expected them to know, but it seems that he did think they should know. And more than this, I think he was a bit disappointed that his parents didn't know where to look for him. Why had they gone looking for him all over the countryside? If he wasn't with his parents, where else would he be? Here he was, a respectful, thoughtful Jewish son who embraced the commandment, honour thy mother and father. He wouldn't intentionally do anything to distress them. I expect, I think he expected that they'd realise that if he wasn't with them, then he must be with his heavenly father. It was, to him, the only logical alternative. Passage goes on to say that after this ordeal, Jesus went back to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents and grew in all the ways that mattered. And he was well liked by God, the people, and presumably by his own family. This is a summary of Jesus' childhood. So why this one story? I believe we have this encounter because it shows an important life lesson for Jesus and his parents Already, Jesus was learning that people don't always understand his actions or his allegiances. He, Jesus, had two conflicting expectations placed on him. His parents expected him to return to Nazareth with them. Father God had called him on to stay for a bit. Jesus made the choice to obey God before anyone else, even before his good parents. And he made the right choice. And this was the first of many times that Jesus would choose to follow God in ways that others didn't expect. His ultimate example of this was in the lead up to the cross when even Jesus' best friends tried to convince him that he shouldn't die. Despite this temptation, Jesus knew who he needed to trust and obey. And as a result, we are all saved and Jesus is now high king of heaven. Father God was given the last say even when his future wasn't clear, because Jesus knew that God's ways are better than ours. So how does this interaction with Jesus inform us about how Jesus meets with us today? When Leith was at the ICO last year, he had a leader who would say, 
I'm your, I'm your servant, but you're not my master. It's a bit of a strange thing to say, don't you think? I understand that he was saying that he was ready to serve the delegates, but his authority ultimately came from God. He gives the orders. Today, Jesus meets us and invites us to join in a life where the voice that carries the most weight for us is our Father's. As adopted sons and daughters of God, we really only have to answer to one person, our Father God. And why is that important? Well, I believe that it's life-changing because in this world where everyone has an opinion, where Christianity isn't always the popular choice, where people have so much pressure placed on them to be liked, to perform well, to be who others think we should be, even in this world, we're set free, released from the pressure of trying to meet other people's expectations. We can rise above peer pressure, above other people's desires for how we should live our lives. We will, by God's grace, serve others in love, just like Jesus served us. We're not aloof, we're not detached from our community. We should all have people that we love, that we respect, and that we listen to. But people are not our masters. God comes first. My allegiance lies first with him, because his way leads to abundant life. And finally today, Jesus reaches out for us to know his grace. He longs for us to seek him because that's how we know what good things he wants for us. We read his word, we worship, we pray, we receive his spirit, and we come to know him. And we recognise that Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations. We may well have been searching for Jesus to do something in our lives or in our world, maybe a prayer hasn't been answered how we want it. And perhaps we've been anxious about this. Today as we meet Jesus, he questions our anxiety. We don't have to be anxious. We can trust that Jesus is fulfilling the will of our Father, like he did as a 12-year-old boy, acting according to God's perfect will. And we can know that this will bring blessing to us in his time. I serve you, but you aren't my master. My allegiance is first and foremost with God, my Father. He leads us all to peace, freedom, and abundant life. In Jesus' name, amen. We may think that we want a saviour who does whatever we expect him to do. But we really need, and what we really need is the one who can be trusted to carry out the perfect will of our Father. We have a Saviour who is mercy and grace. We have a Saviour who, when he speaks, the earth shakes and the heavens tremble. We don't cherry-pick the Jesus, we, Jesus as we wish him to be. We come to meet Jesus face to face as he is. As we come this morning, we may need to experience the assurance of his love. We may need him to bring correction. We confess when we have sought our agenda for ourselves and for others instead of desiring God's direction. We come and meet with our Saviour. As he calls our name, let's experience his presence and power. Come and renew and reshape us today. If you've never met Jesus perfect personally, today can be that day for you. Come forward and we'd love to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. If you'd like someone to pray with you as you bring a concern before God, then come forward um, and someone would love to pray with you. Come and seek God's grace today. Come and stand or kneel at the front and we would love to pray a blessing over you today. We're going to respond to Jesus this morning face to face. Just let me say how much I love you.
Let me speak of your mercy and grace. Let me see you face to face. Let's pray together. Sending song over a thousand tongues who can sing that as their testimony. Knowing what we have experienced in Jesus, we want everyone to know this. As we go from our meeting, we pray that God would help us to live this week in a way that brings honour to the name of Jesus. We go to live believing in, calling on, and speaking out the name of Jesus the one who calms our fears, the one who is good news for sinners, the one who brings life and health and peace. Let's sing together this wonderful song as our sending song.
let's share together the blessing for this week. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go out strong in the grace of God, knowing that his blood avails for you. It washes the sinner clean in his life and health and peace. Thank you.